Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. I have to ask, I was home picking up Sharon. Uh, did we get a reading from John 14? Great. Curious, who read it? Thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> I had told uh, Tommy earlier this week that my title was going to be My Father in His House. So I left it as a subtitle, even though I decided to change the title to Portraits of the Father. But we're working our way through the uh, Statement of Faith, Bethel Statement of Faith, which we've recently sort of updated and expanded a bit. Uh, but <coughs> don't worry, nothing radical. Uh, it just takes a while to get seven people to agree on the wording of that kind of a document. Uh, so... That is not going to stay. Hmm. Where is that twist happening? That twist is happening down there. There we go. Uh, so I wanted to start, though, by reading from Exodus chapter 3. Uh, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, and this is the scene of the burning bush, uh, that you may recall from Exodus 3. So Moses has been raised in Egypt. Uh, he's been schooled in Pharaoh's house. He's then been sent off uh, uh, or has run away, really, from uh, potential trouble after he got himself into some trouble. And he's now spent 40 years uh, living in the wilderness, uh, in the desert, uh, and uh, suddenly he sees this bush that is on fire but which is not burning up. And he goes over to see it. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And you know, I, I couldn't help but think as we come to this subject of studying God the Father, it's good to remember that this, this is holy ground. Uh, and, and we'll try to be careful as we look at this subject, uh, because uh, this is... Almighty God presented to us in the form of the Father, uh, and it's important to remember that we need to treat this subject carefully and reverently and with great, with great respect. The Statement of Faith uh, reads, the Bethel Statement of Faith reads, God the Father is the first person of the Holy Trinity. The Scriptures teach that God is our Father in the natural sense because he created us in his image, as in Genesis 1.27. We actually had some of that read to us in the first service this morning. God created man in his own image. The scriptures also teach that he can become our father and we his children in the spiritual sense if we receive his son, Jesus Christ, as Savior and Lord, as in John 1 and 1 John 3. We're actually going to look at those passages a little bit this morning. The fatherhood of God is taught both in the Old Testament, where God is portrayed as a loving, compassionate, and generous father, and in the New Testament, where Jesus teaches us to address God as our Father in heaven, as in Matthew chapter 6. Let's just pray before we continue. Our God and our loving Father, we thank you that we can come to you this morning as our Father. We thank you that we can enter your presence as your children. And we pray that as we look at this subject this morning, you would open our hearts and our minds to understand what your word has to say to us. And, and we would pray that you would warm our hearts as we consider what a loving, gracious, forgiving, compassionate Father you are. And for those here this morning who don't know you, Father, as, as their own Father, we'd ask you to open their hearts and minds too and touch their hearts. We, we know there are some here who have, had, uh, have perhaps not known their own earthly fathers and others who have had uh, difficult fathers, and others perhaps who have had some great fathers, but, but regardless of where we come from in our personal life and in our backgrounds with our, our blessings and our baggage, we'd ask you just help us to understand the kind of father you are. So we'd ask this now in Jesus' name, amen. So I was thinking about portraits, and I thought, you know, how do you describe someone to someone else when it's, it's someone that you feel like you know well and they don't know them at all? And have you ever had that experience? Someone says to you, so what are they like? And you're like, where do I start? How do I describe what this person is like? Uh, and <laughs> I'm not going to pick on anyone in my family and start describing them to you. 
Uh, Sharon just relaxed a little bit. <laughs> but I, I wanted to take this concept of portraits and say, can we try to look at God the Father from the standpoint of the various portraits that are seen in Scripture? Uh, you know, there's a portrait that has been in the news uh, in the last couple of weeks, uh, is this particular portrait took a very long walk from Ottawa over to Italy uh, in the uh, apparently it was stolen right out of the Chateau Laurier during the COVID shutdown uh, and was replaced with a fake. Uh, and the real one has been hanging in someone's living room in Italy for the last couple of years. Uh, and it, it recently made its way back. And apparently it's on its way back now, as you may have read in the news or seen in the news, it's on its way back to the Chateau Laurier and it's going to be rehung at some point. Uh, but why was this portrait of Winston Churchill considered so important? And it was considered important simply because of all of the thousands and thousands of pictures taken of Winston Churchill. It conveyed the, the wartime leader better than pretty much any other picture taken of Winston Churchill. Uh, and <coughs> you may have heard the story. If you had a, have, I'm sorry, it, if you find it, may find it boring to hear it again, I'll keep it brief. But uh, Yusuf, or Karsh, uh, Yusuf Karsh was the photographer and had been granted permission by the Canadian delegation to take a picture of Winston Churchill when he was visiting Ottawa. And uh, so Winston grudgingly agreed to have his, his photo taken, uh, but was chewing away on his cigar as he posed for the picture. And Yusuf Karsh got his lighting all set up, got the picture just ready to go, and then with no warning watch, walked over and snatched the cigar away from Winston Churchill and Winston Churchill was instantly furious and glared at the camera. Yusuf Carr says that as he took the picture, he was afraid that he was going to be immediately eaten following the picture taking. But that steely anger and determination shone through in the portrait and captured the, the wartime leader called Winston Churchill. Uh, and so it was a, <coughs> in many ways, it was a brilliant portrait, brilliantly captured and became... Uh, probably the most famous picture of Winston Churchill. Uh, so, so this is what portraits can do for us, right? It's just a picture. It doesn't tell everything. It doesn't tell what kind of husband he was. Uh, you know, that's a completely different subject. Uh, but it, it captures a certain aspect of the man. Uh, I put, uh, I threw this in here. This is a picture of my dad. It was taken for his uh, tw their 25th wedding anniversary. Uh, would have been I think the anniversary would have been in 77. I think the picture was actually taken in 78. Um, and so this captures sort of a formal version of my own father. Uh, but when we as his kids think about him, we don't really think of him this way. Uh, you know, I think of him sometimes on the dock. We, we always loved the way he dove in. Uh, he only learned to swim in his 20s. And he would sometimes on a hot day, he would walk off the dock onto a big rock that stuck out in front of the, the, the dock. Uh, and he would put his toes in the water to make sure it wasn't too cold. Uh, and then he would simply fall forward <laughs> with a loud smashing noise as he hit the water. Okay, and he called that a dive. Uh, we thought that was quite hilarious. Uh, but I think to those of us who have memories of him as kids, that is just one of the portraits, if you will, that we have of him. So we, <coughs> we have different, these different portraits. Uh, now, when we talk about understanding God the Father, this becomes, it, it, you know, what, in effect, what angle do you take? What do you look at? Uh, he is the first person of the Godhead. Uh, he is the one in whom uh, you know, who has existed from a past eternity along with the other members of the Godhead. He is, he is gracious and loving and kind, and yet he, he, he through, uh, through his power, also carries out judgment on the wicked. So there's, there's many aspects to him. So we're going to take a look at this. Jesus says in Matthew 11, he makes a very intriguing statement in Matthew 11, when he says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son 
and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Interesting passage. He, in essence, is telling us that the Father is easier to understand than the Son. Uh, you say, well, wait, wait a sec. Well, but we, Jesus came to this earth, and we saw him living here and walking among other people and doing miracles and showing his love and his kindness and, and going to the cross. And surely that's easier to understand than this sort of more abstract father that we haven't actually seen and, and hasn't visited earth in human form. And, you know, but there's, in a way, I, like I sort of understand in a way what he's driving at here, I think, in that there's a mystery about the son that, that in a way we can never explain. How was he fully God and fully man? How did he become sin and carry that sin to the cross and pay for it on my behalf? Uh, these are all mysteries that we talk about. We talk about them as though we understand them. Uh, and yet, there, there's a mystery that goes at least beyond my feeble little bit of gray matter uh, that in terms of what was happening there. But so he says, you know, no one really understands the son except the father. But he says, hey, here's the good news. No one understands the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So he says, in effect, I can reveal the Father to you. Uh, and <laughs> in, in John 14, he starts talking about his Father's house as this, this place that we can look forward to going to. And, and he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And so that word troubled is a very strong word. He, it, it, it implies almost a shuddering, okay? So he, he says, it's like the, the emotional version of shuddering, if you will, okay? So he says, don't let your heart start to shudder. Uh, it's used in the previous chapter when he's actually talking about uh, the person, someone's going to betray him. And it says he was troubled in spirit and testified. And in fact, his, his spirit was shuddering at the thought that someone was going to betray him. But now he reassures us and says, but you, don't, don't let your heart start to shudder. Uh, he knew what was coming, right? He's preparing the disciples for what's coming. This is John 14. He's in the upper room. He's heading to the cross. He's going to be on the cross in a matter of hours. The disciples are going to forsake him and flee. The, the enemies of, of Christ are going to be also threatening his disciples. And then we're going to come to the book of Acts, and there's going to be tremendous persecution against the church. They're, they're heading into dark times. Great times, incredible times, but difficult times. And he says, yeah, through all that, don't, don't let your hearts be troubled. Why? You believe in God, believe also in me, and my Father's house, or my Father's house has many rooms. I love that song that came out, I don't remember, it's probably been out a number of years now, about my, my Father's house, a great big house with many, many rooms, great big table with lots and lots of food. It, it, to me, it creates a very fun image of heaven that we're, we're headed towards, but... But he says, here, my father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? So he wants us to live our lives here, not troubled, and with, in effect, the light of the father's house shining in our eyes. Have you, have you ever been that when you're, you're in a place where there's virtually no city light and it's, it's like pitch dark and you're really wishing you'd brought a flashlight? You know, it probably goes back a few years because now we all have phones with lights on them, so it's... It's a little easier, but, but sometimes I've been in that situation, and you're kind of trying to stumble towards the house with the lights, and, you, and you're so glad that way over there you can see the light, and if you can just get there without falling flat, you'll, you'll be so glad, right? And, and I feel like this is the image he's portraying. He's saying to the disciples, look, you're going to be going through dark times, but remember, I'm going to prepare a place in my father's house, a place with many rooms, and I want you to live with the light of that dwelling in your future shining in your eyes. Uh, you know, I, this morning I got up before dark and I came down to our, our living room and it was really pitch dark outside. But when I looked out through the front windows, I could see sort of uh, coming up sort of just a glimmer from behind the horizon. And you're like, ah, that's it. That's the promise of morning light. And so, so he wants us to live that way. He says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Okay, I, I don't think Thomas was as grumpy as he sometimes comes across, okay? But, but this is one of his, you know, one of his lines, a classic Thomas line, right? 
He's like, in effect, he says, what do you mean, Lord? We know the place, the way to the place you're going. We don't know where you're going. We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus answers, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Probably one of the most difficult passages in Scripture for people who, who profess Christianity but have not truly accepted the message of gospel for themselves. And that is the absolutely exclusive claim to be the one way to God the Father. And Jesus clearly is making that statement here. He's saying, I'm it. If you want to get to the Father, there's only one way. It's through me. Okay, in John 10, he says, I am the gate. Here he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, there's absolutely no other way to the Father. You say, wow, is that an arrogant statement? How can you use the term arrogant? The chapter before, he was washing the disciples' feet. A few chapters later, he's hanging on a cross in an absolutely shameful way of dying as a criminal hung between two other criminals, taking my sin in his own body on that cross. No, not arrogance. He's just telling us the truth. He's just telling us there is only one way, and if you want to find a way to this Father, this incredible, wonderful, amazing Father, he's saying, it's through me. That's the only way. He says, if you really know me, you will know my Father as well. I love that. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And so he's telling us that if you want to study the Father, study the Son. Because when you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. Uh, and that, we don't have time to get into it, but Hebrews chapter 1, you get the same concept there. I mean, it's carried, that thought is carried through the New Testament, a wonderful thought. Philip says, Lord, show us the Father and that'll be enough for us. You can imagine. Philip knows that all through the Old Testament, no one saw the Father. And now Jesus is saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's like, wow, you're giving us a ticket to see the Father? In effect, he's saying, hey, Lord, that's on my bucket list. I, I'd love to see the Father. If I get to see the Father, I, I won't need to see anything else. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been with you or among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Uh, and so he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So when we want to look at a portrait of the Father, we look at the Son. Uh, because even though the Son, in a sense, is a mystery that's hard to comprehend, he came to show us the Father and to show us the heart of the Father. You know, I heard a story years ago that I assume was a joke, but it illustrates the point about identical twins that were separated at birth. One ended up in a Middle Eastern family, one ended up in a Spanish family. And so the one was named Amal, and the other was named Juan. Years later, they actually met, and people realized that when you've seen one, you've seen them all. <laughs> but that is, to a certain extent, the point here, isn't it? Jesus is saying, not that they're identical twins, but he's saying that the resemblance is so strong that he says, when you're studying the heart of the Son, you're seeing the heart of the Father. And when you're studying the actions of the Son, you're seeing the actions of the Father. He says the words, don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. And so we see the heart of the Father through the Son. We've got to keep moving. In Matthew chapter 6, we find Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and he says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Uh, and I'm going to jump down to that last paragraph. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And so this is one of the, in effect, the portraits of the Father, is he is a Father who sees and he sees the load you're carrying. He sees the work you're doing. There are times around the church where you carry out activities and you're like, wow, nobody seems to appreciate that at all. Well, that's good because that means you did it for the father and he's a father who sees uh, and he's a father who will reward. <coughs> and so we serve the father uh, and what is done in secret will be rewarded by him. He's a father who sees. Remember Hagar when she's having to run away from Abraham and Sarah with her son. And, and she, what does she end up saying? Sorry, it's the King James that comes to mind. 
thou God seest me, right? She, she came to this realization that there was a father. She was taking her son away from Abraham, the father. But she realized there was another father. There was God, the father. And God was seeing and, and was caring and was caring for Hagar and her son. Uh, he says, when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. So he still calls on us to ask him, because that's what kids do with their parents, right? They ask. They have a need. They ask. And so we're told to come and ask, but he knows what we need before we ask. Uh, and some of you may have had, as I mentioned in my prayer, some of you may have had fathers like that, that were insightful and caring and kind and loving and often anticipated your needs, and some of you did not. Some of you came from difficult backgrounds where it was absolutely not so. But here is the promise of the scripture. There is a father who wants to get to know you, who wants a personal relationship with you, wants you to come to him with your requests and with your needs, and with your heart, and he knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread <coughs> and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So what are the subjects we can come to our Father with? This is, to me, this prayer itself is a different, its own, in, in a way, portrait of the Father. We find someone here who is, yes, is in heaven, but we are to pray that his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why? Because his will is perfect. Uh, sometimes we run into that, right? Sometimes that's hard. Sometimes we hit difficult times in our life and we're like, really? Is this the will of the Father? We don't always understand what he's doing. Because he is in heaven and we are on earth. And scripture says, therefore, let your words be few. His wisdom is so much greater than ours. We don't understand the full story that he's writing, but we're part of it. And we're called to trust him and trust his loving heart. I remember speaking of my own father, him sometimes sing to us when we'd be at very difficult times in our lives. And he would say, whatever you do, don't miss what God has for you in this. And I've always thought that was a, an important lesson to, to keep in mind. You know, sometimes God brings us through difficult times, and we have difficult things to learn. It's a crying shame when the Father takes us through a difficult time, and we miss what he wanted to teach us. Okay, it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, paying to take a course and then not bothering showing up to class. You're like, well, what do you pay the tuition fees for? Okay. So there will be times where, in effect, your father, your heavenly father, calls on you to, to take a lesson. And you're going to pay the fee. Whether you bother showing up for class and learning anything from it sort of depends on your reaction to what you're called to walk through. Uh, but here he says, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that's to to recognize that he is in heaven, recognize that he is holy, and recognize that his will is perfect. And yet bring him our needs. Give us today our daily bread. We can bring our needs to God. Forgive us our debts. We know we have sinned. We know we've sinned in the last hour, in the last 24 hours, in the last week. Uh, it's a brother that years and years ago, I used to hear some, sometimes say, always keep short accounts with God. Don't run up a long tab, okay? When you know something's come between you and the Father, confess it. Ask for forgiveness. Keep your account short. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So ask for spiritual protection. You not only the physical things, the daily bread, but also the spiritual things, spiritual protection and care, also provided by who? Our Heavenly Father. 
And yet, what do we find here right in the next two verses? For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And so he says there's a, there's a manner of behavior that comes with being a true child of the Father. And as he forgives, he expects you to exhibit that family behavior, that, that family characteristic. He has given you eternal life through the death of his son if you're one of his children. And so he says, live out that life, that nature, that divine nature that has been given to you. And in there is the desire to forgive. And so he says, <coughs> you expect the father to give you forgiveness, you are also to give others forgiveness. And there's a penalty to pay even when we are believers, when we hold unforgiveness in our hearts. Okay, and so if this morning you are holding unforgiveness in your heart against another brother or sister in Christ or even a, a non-believer, and you're holding that anger and that grudge, let it go because it is costing you. It is, it is a heavy burden that is weighing you down and God will insist that it continue to torment you until you are willing to let it go. And so he calls on us to forgive. So it's a father who is loving and kind and gracious and cares for us physically and spiritually uh, and offers us forgiveness, but also uh, we are accountable to him. There's not only forgiveness, there's also accountability. When you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. So it will not, not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, I'm sure there's somebody here sitting in the audience looking at me up here with my double chin and saying, that guy never fasts, okay? And, and yeah, I haven't, I haven't made it my Olympic sport. Uh, but the, the point of the passage here is that when we spend time with the father and we seek his face, and we seek forgiveness, and we, we, we spend that time with him, whether we're fasting or spending time in prayer, to enjoy that relationship with the Father. He says, you will be rewarded. And God delights to reward us for time spent with him. <clears throat> I'm watching that clock there. I should just switch to my watch. My watch died Friday night at 10 to 12. So even when I finish, my watch is still going to say 10 to 12. Um, it's a great watch. Uh, but I, I want to take just a minute here to look at the, the story of the prodigal son. The, he, Jesus tells the story. I'm not going to read it all, but he tells the story about this man with two sons. And one of the sons says to the father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Now, picture the father at that point in time, right? What does the father do? He knows this is going to lead to tragedy in the life of his son. I mean, imagine if you've got, I don't know how old the son was, but it's a younger one. So let's say he's 18. 18-year-old 18 shows up and says to his father, hey, hey, dad, I've estimated the value of your estate. I think everything all told is about two million bucks, so give me a million and I'm out of here. Father's like, okay, this is going to be a problem. Okay, I mean, some things are hard to predict. Some things are not hard to predict. This one was not hard to predict. Okay. But the father ends up realizing that he, if he ever really wants to have that son and ever really wants to have that kind of incredible father-son relationship, he needs to let him learn the hard way. And so he divides up the estate and the son books a ticket to a distant country. And what do we have here? We have pretty soon he's blown everything. He's partied hardy and he's out of cash. And now he's having to work for a living, and he's hungry. I guess whatever minimum wage was in that place didn't pay very well. So he longs to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And he comes to his senses, and he says, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And so... I find it fascinating here that, that what was key in this restoration was his recognition that he didn't deserve to be a son. And you know, as much as we are created by God, and in that natural sense, we are all sons of God, we need to come to the point in our, in our lives where we realize we do not deserve to be a son of God. We are we're evil. Uh, we have sin in our hearts. We are in 
often in full-blown rebellion against the God of the universe. Uh, and we don't deserve to be his son. Uh, but in coming to that recognition is actually the beginnings of salvation and the beginnings of restoration to having a true spiritual relationship with the God who wants to be our heavenly father. And so he says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father while he's still a long way off. His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And so, but I love the reaction of the father here. There's a, I've got a great article at home that talks about the, the history and the culture at the time. And, and typically when a son returned home after shaming and embarrassing the family like that, if anyone in the village saw him coming into the town, they would actually send out an alert around the town that one of these shameful kids was coming back into town. And everyone would pick up clods of dirt. And, and as he came into the center of the town, they would be pelting him with clods of dirt and shouting, shame, shame, shame. Okay, not a great homecoming. The father knows this, he anticipates this, and he runs, and he grabs that son while he's still not even into the village, and he throws his arms around him and kisses him. And they come into the village with the father's arm around the son. Nobody's gonna dare throw clods of dirt now. There's no shame. Just absolute, incredible, heavenly style forgiveness. Amazing, amazing. And if you are willing to come to the Father and say, I'm not worthy to be your son, please forgive me, you will get that same treatment. Arm around you, hugs, kisses, welcoming, and protection from shame. That is what the Father offers to you. Absolutely incredible. The Father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. This son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so the, this father and this son finally have the relationship. You maybe say they always should have had. But the son had to reach that point of saying, you know what, I don't deserve this. This is all from him. And that's the point we all need to reach. <clears throat> John 1, 30, John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning through him, all things were made. Let's skip down to that last line. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And so John 1 sort of sets up this background and says, you know, there, let's go way, way back to the beginning of time. No, no, not the beginning of time. Let's go back before that. Let's go back to before the beginning. Well, actually, we can't go any further back, can we? Okay, let's start there, okay? And he says, in the beginning, yeah, God was already there. And he says, and the word was with God and the word was God. And so he's introducing God the Son and the deity of God the Son and helping us to understand that out of him come all things. He is the source of all that was created. And so he says, but he says, the true light that emanated out of that darkness in the past and, and created all things, uh, that true light is now coming into the world. He was in the world. The world was, though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. To those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Do you believe in his name? You know, we can study God the Father very theoretically and theologically and for a long time. Uh, we could probably run a six-week course on it. There's, there's lots of material on God the Father. But the real question is, do you believe in his name? Because if you believe in the name of Christ, and if you believe in his death on the cross, and you believe that he died for you, and that it was your sins that put him there, and you ask for forgiveness in his name, you are given the right to become a child of God. Absolutely incredible. A child of God, okay? A child of God who can live with the light of the Father's house shining in your eyes. You can go through difficult times in life and look up saying, hey, life is difficult, but when I look up, I see there, I see light. It's the light of the Father's house, and I see it coming. I read a while ago about a 
man, I don't remember his name, but his doctor commented that he was, he was on his deathbed and he was so excited about going to the father's house, he lived for an extra fortnight. Okay, which tells me the guy must have been from England because nobody else talks about fortnights. Uh, but he was, he, the excitement of going home to the father's house helped him to stay alive for an extra two weeks. Talk about frustrating. So, so but, but this is this right that we have to become children of God. Ephesians 1.3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms within every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. Okay, now remember here, he gave us the right to be children of God, born of God. So actually born into the family of God. Ephesians 1 says, yeah, by the way, you're also adopted. Okay, so, so that means God chose you. Okay, I was born into my parents' family, uh, and they couldn't change their mind after I arrived. Okay, they were stuck with me. Uh, adoption involves choice, right? It's, it's someone reaching out and saying, I want you in my family. Okay, and so this, this is part of the, the beauty of our Father God, is that we, as children of God, as those have, who have accepted Christ, we are born into the family of God, we share the nature of God, we have his life th flowing through our veins, he transforms us to be like his son by giving us the life and nature of Christ. Absolutely incredible, but he says, oh, but by the way, you're also kind of adopted because I chose you. Incredible. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. And now I know we're out of time. Just one closing thought for you. Um, notice this. See what great love the Father has lavished on us. This is 1 John 3, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Okay? Can you see the monarch butterfly up there in the corner? No, yeah, well... You just don't see it yet, but that's what it is, okay? And so some of us, we kind of still look like caterpillars, don't we? But the point here in 1 John 3 is he says, I know it's sometimes hard for people to recognize that we are truly children of God, but he says that is what we are. The Father has lavished that on us. And he says, the world doesn't recognize it yet. It didn't recognize him either. Uh, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but he says, when Christ appears, we shall be like him, okay? We will go through that metamorphosis process, and we will truly be shown to be just like Christ. So yeah, we don't all look like monarch butterflies yet, but that is the very life and nature that is in us. And it will be revealed as God continues to work in us and through us and shows us to truly be his children. And one day he will take us to the Father's house where as part of his big family, we will celebrate together the gracious loving kindness of the Father as exhibited through his son, Jesus Christ.